Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us um, for our Hila CLE for January. Um, I, we are joined today by Shahara Wright of the Wright Law Firm um, to discuss um, nonprofits and uh, nonprofit board management. Um, Ms. Wright uh, is a CEO, business, and nonprofit law attorney and a business strategist. Um, she's an award winning author and highly sought after international speaker. Uh, Ms. Wright has been the owner and lead attorney of the Wright, law, Wright Firm, sorry, the Wright Firm PLLC for over 20 years and works with fast growing seven with fa fast growing seven-figure small businesses and nonprofit organizations that are ready to implement a strategy to build capacity. She also provides small and mid-sized companies with legal and business strategies, including entity formation, mergers and acquisitions, investor packages, and contracts. So today um, we will let Ms. Wright present and then we will ask you to hold your questions until the end, please. Please feel free to use the chat or the Q&A function to um, put questions when you think of them and we will have them addressed at the end. Um, and with that, I will hand over to Ms. Wright. Thank you. Sorry, I think you're still on mute. It just thing came up. So I see I'm having feedback. Hold on one second. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh. <laughs> So I have my other computer up, which should be able to share. I don't, I still don't have the share one on the one that has no video. Should be. All right, there we go. Oh, well, no, it's no telling me I can't share. So can we get a share, uh, maybe co-host? Yes, give me just a moment. Okay. Hi, everyone. So sorry for the delay, but we're going to be talking about how to handle board disputes. And this really is going to be kind of a compilation of understanding board management, um, things that cause disputes, and things that you can do to not necessarily prevent them, because I don't even know that that's possible, but kind of subdue and try to kind of get a hold of board disputes that happen. So just kind of given some background about me, oh, if I could just move. Um, my name is Shahara Wright. I know that there was a brief introduction and I won't spend a lot of time talking about myself, but um, I'm a business and nonprofit law attorney. I work with small businesses and nonprofit organizations as general counsel. Um, and specifically with um, nonprofit organizations, a lot of my work has to do with handling board disputes, um, conflicts of interest, uh, reorganizations that happen when EDs leave or chairs leave or long serving um, members of organizations and navigating through those ups and downs of and challenges of working with um, boards and long serving um, staff and those kinds of things. So the first part we're going to start talking about is fiduciary duty. And I think that this is something that you always have to start with when we are having a conversation um, about board duties, um, board responsibilities. And a lot of times people kind of say, oh, I know, I hear it, but I think it gets lost in the conversation because the responsibility for the board is um, this fiduciary duty. And a lot of times with nonprofit organizations, especially when you have a lot of inexperienced people that are working on the board, if they kind of have this corporate mindset when they bring it to uh, nonprofits, which is good in some ways and bad in the other ways, where you have a board that is in control, not any one individual member. And so you have to remind everyone as a whole that they have fiduciary duty. So what is a fiduciary duty? When it comes to a nonprofit board, a fiduciary duty requires board members to stay objective, unselfish, responsible, honest, trustworthy, and efficient. And these sound easy enough to do but there's always someone or a group of someone that kind of caused this problem uh, to 
to cause things to kind of get out of hand. And so you have to kind of bring back and say, this is your responsibility. This is your legal responsibility. Um, and as long as you are a member of this board, this is your responsibility and being clear about what that is. So the first one that we want to talk about is duty of care. And duty of care for a nonprofit organization refers to the legal and ethical obligation of board members and other leaders to exercise reasonable and diligence, um, reasonable care and diligence in carrying out their responsibilities and making decisions on behalf of the organization. And again, all of these things sound easy in theory, but when it comes out to actually carrying out and making decisions, it's not always as easy as it seems. So it's important to really kind of understand and say, hey, you have to be ethical, reasonable care, which, you know, it is not one of those um, standards that you really have to, you know, that's black and white. You got to kind of think about what makes sense in the moment. And are you doing what you're supposed to be doing? So duty of care can kind of look at the business judgment rule. And just in a nutshell about what the business judgment rule really is, is that when a board is making decisions, they're making a the decision in the best um, case scenario for the organization that they kind of provided some understanding, asked questions, overview of what's going on, and made a, their best business judgment, right? Which may not be the right judgment, but they they took some time to make a make a decision and made the decision. And that's really what that is. So it's a very low standard, in my opinion, and one that's easy if they actually are doing what they're supposed to be doing. So you're not going to be held liable. A director won't when they acted in good faith. So that could be active oversight. Staying informed about activities and finances of the organization, regularly attending board meetings, which can be a problem. Financial management, not micromanage, but ensuring that they are understanding what the P&L says, they understand what the um, expenditures are, revenue are, is, all of those different things they understand. Supervision of services, again, this is not micromanagement, but really just making sure that things are being properly managed, right? That there is a system in place to ensure that the services are being carried out the way they should be um, and there's no problems and not misappropriating funds um, and kind of cutting down on conflicts of interest, which we'll talk about later, conflicts of interest will happen, but being having a process about dealing with those conflicts of interest. The next one is the duty of loyalty. The duty of loyalty for a nonprofit organization refers to the legal and ethical obligation of board members and other leaders to act in the best interest of the organization rather than their own personal or other conflicting interests. Again, sounds great because lots of people um, join organizations or found um, organizations because they care about something. But lots of people end up getting territorial around the organization because they care a little too much. Um, maybe they want a little bit more control. They like um, the, the, the status that it gives them. All of these different things kind of come up when it comes to uh, nonprofit organizations. And so it's kind of important to remind that it's the organization that's important, not your own personal needs and wants. So again, conflicts of interest. Conflict of interest is when a board action or decision becomes unreliable because of a clash between personal and self-serving interests. So one of the biggest um, conflicts of interest is have to do with payment. So if you have an executive director, maybe a founder, that started the organization, they've been doing things for free, paying stuff out of their own pocket, the organization finally starts getting some money and now they wanna get paid for their service. That in it inherently, especially if this person is on the board, maybe let's say it's a three person um, board, you have a conflict of interest, there's just no getting around that. Does that mean that their person can't get paid? No, but there needs to be a process, right, to handle that conflict of interest and having voting procedures, how does that um, look out? How do we determine pay? All of those kinds of things, there needs to be a process. Now, all nonprofits should have a conflict of interest policy, and we'll again, we'll talk about that more later on, but this is really what that conflict of interest and duty of loyalty and paying attention to what the organization needs versus what the person needs. Misappropriation of resources, again, happens all the time. Uh, when a person diverts or takes the organization's resources for personal gain. 
And a lot of times people look at this in terms of money and they think, okay, well, they're moving money. But I was in a nonprofit um, Facebook group um, several months ago and I'm, I'm in a couple of them. And if someone asked a question about their ED, they have they had a food pantry and the ED was taking snacks, right, out of the food pantry for herself, right? She was either taking some home or eating them and those kinds of things. That is a misappropriation of resources, right? Because the snacks are not for you. Um, they are for um, either the residents or the people that they're serving. That's who that should have the snacks. So that's a misappropriation of resources outright theft. So again, having checks and balances, making people sure, making sure people understand what these um, donations are for, what these, um, the assets are for, how they can be used, when they can use, it's really be important. And in confidentiality, lots of board members like to talk. I will include myself in this and talk about the stuff that's happening in an organization, Board drama tends to get it, fights that happen, people get angry and go on rants on social media. Um, and so it's important to maintain confidentiality within the board meeting, being clear about what stuff is supposed to stay um, inside the meeting, what stuff can be released, when it can be released, those types of things um, is important. Again, just making clear to board members that their responsibility lies to the organization, not in their own personal interest or desires. And then last but not least is the duty of obedience. The duty of obedience for a nonprofit organization refers to the legal and ethical obligation to comply with the organization's mission, purpose, and governing documents such as bylaws and articles of incorporation. And bylaws usually um, are a problem because a lot of organizations We'll find something online. Um, they'll kind of cut and paste what they think makes sense to them at the moment. Um, and so sometimes it leaves a lot of gaps um, and with uh, the organization and what should or shouldn't be there. And so therefore it can become a lot of, it can cause a lot of problems. Um, you know, I tell people my, my bare minimum bylaws is about 20 pages um, of information and I like a lot of white space. So that also, you know, makes it a little longer, but you might see something that's five pages or six pages. And so, you know, that there's going to be a lot of room left about how an organization operates. And so we want to make sure that those those things are clear, right? So does the organization have bylaws that accurately reflect the current function of the board of the organization? Um, some boards have policies of renewing their um, bylaws every two to three years. I think that's a good policy. Sometimes you see bylaws that were maybe uh, put in place 10 years ago and the organization doesn't look anything like it did 10 years ago. Sometimes they change the bylaws, but they don't actually formally vote them in. You don't know what the bylaws are the most current bylaws, which ones were signed, which ones were voted on. And there's no real process, right, to understand what bylaws are actually current or not current. Um, does the organization have the proper policies and procedures in place? And we'll talk more about policies and procedures a little bit later. But this, again, has to do with other documentation for the organization itself, maybe separate and apart from the board, to ensure that, you know, everyone, not just the board itself, but the staff, the ED, all of those um, have proper procedures and policies about how to act. Um, before agreeing to serve on boards, did the organization provide a statement of board member expectations? This is something that I think a lot of nonprofits um, lack um, just because they need board members. So they're kind of grabbing warm bodies, but you don't know. I wanted to serve on a board um, that I really had very much interest in serving in this organization. But when I got on the board and I did get on the board, I realized that they really wanted the board members to be fundraisers. That's not my strength. I'm not a strong fundraiser. That's not where I feel like my biggest gift is. So I really didn't want to be on a board where 90% of my responsibility was doing fundraisers. And I ended up leaving the board probably um, six or seven months down the line. And that was because I wasn't properly informed or made aware of that my expectation was I was going to be doing this amount of fundraising. And I think it's important to let people know what your expectations are them. 
are board members properly informed of their legal obligations? Again, usually nonprofits are not providing um, board retreats. There's no orientation. There's no kind of, hey, due diligence thing. This is what we expect and how you do it. It's kind of maybe sign here, dot here um, kind of thing. And you really just are not aware of what all you're expected of when you come in there. And um, our board members instructed on their roles as steward of the charitable or, um, assets. And again, um, I think that having a board retreat once a year for incoming um, board members and then bringing in the current board members is the best method um, to really get everybody up to speed and on one page about what's supposed to happen. So I know that was a kind of like a speed through on a uh, fiduciary duty, but I think you can get from that just kind of a general census of where board members should really be thinking about. So here I really wanna talk about two main types of boards. Um, and there's a working board and then there's a management board. And the working board usually exists when there's no paid staff. And there's, there's other board hybrids out there. We're just gonna be talking about these two because these two are the ones that you're gonna most often see um, although there's some other setups. Um, so the working board exists when there's no paid staff. The board is doing the heavy lifting when it comes to running the organization, the day-to-day -day, um, operations, volunteering, making the programs happen. Um, they're on the ground, right? Working boards are hard. They take a lot of time. And um, it's almost like a second job. If you've ever been on a working board, um, those of you that are um, board members for HILA um, or any other kind of board that you might be on, PTOs, those kinds of things, um, it, it can be a second job um, and can be very taxing. Um, these members are usually very dedicated, but the time commitment can be a bit lot, bit much. Um, burnout happens quite easily. Um, and then with the board members, you also have, you know, officers within that board. Um, and so, uh, this discussion regarding officers and directors sometimes kind of coincide with one another, um, whereas in a, a different type of board setup, that may not be necessarily the case. So working boards usually, um, again, these are kind of gen generalities, right? You usually have a working board when you have like less than 500000 annually um, revenue, right? Because you don't have any paid staff. You may have like a PTO booster club, small churches, religious organizations, civic organizations, HOAs. Um, these are kind of smaller organizations that are community-run, led organizations. Um, a lot of the people who serve care about the mission um, of the organization, but they lack um, nonprofit experience, they don't really understand structure. Most of the time, the more sophisticated uh nonprofit um, board members, so to speak, um, are gonna be high, um, on more of the management type boards where we're gonna talk about um, in, in the future in just a moment. And so uh, a lot of these people are gonna be new to the nonprofit world and maybe not really understand how nonprofits work in general. Um, that means that there's a lack of oversight um, there's not a lot of um, compliance going on there. Um, so therefore, there could be a lot of controls that shouldn't be there. Um, a lot of times you'll see that it's founder led or controlled by a single individual group of um, individuals. So sometimes, you know, the founder is doing the heavy lifting, most of the work, everybody's fine because they don't really want to do all the work that the founder's doing. But also, again, those checks and balances aren't there, uh, which could lead to problems later on. And then a management board um, is a, just is kind of more of a traditional board structure where there's a staff to carry out the operations of the organization. Um, the board determines the goals and priorities and the staff carries it out. So if you kind of think about it, right, you have the board um, and then they have their officers of the board, like the chair, the vice chair, the the um, secretary and, you know, maybe the treasurer, but these are people that oversee, right? They don't actually do the day-to-day decision-making. This board will hire um, the, the executive director or president or whatever they're going to call it, um, and they're going to put that person in place, and that ED is going to hire all the staff that goes up under it. So the ED typically is going to be the person that answers to the board. They may or may not be um, expert 
official members of the board. Um, but either way, they are going to be um, the ones that make these decisions about what happens for the day to day. Um, and uh, sometimes um, the board will have authority to point uh, different positions, maybe something like a CFO, um, but usually it's one or two positions at best um, that the board is going to do. And that person or persons are going to answer directly to um, the board. When this happens, there has to be some clear um, lines between board responsibilities and officer responsibilities. Uh, it's very important um, that there's clarity because a lot of times, especially with smaller organizations, and when I mean smaller, just in terms of number of people, um, a lot of times board members will take on some responsibilities, kind of get involved with the staff and what's happening with the staff, start asking questions. People might come to somebody in the board and want to know what's going on. And therefore you end up having um, this situation where you um, have blurred lines um, of what the board should or should not be doing and what they should or should not be having access to. And again, having policies and procedures um, will make a big difference with that. So what does a managing board look like? You know, typically you have a million plus in revenue, five or more employees, although I just um, did a consult and they really just have an executive director. This one organization, they just have an executive director. They've only always just had an executive director, um, but the board still does a lot of heavy lifting. So I would still say that they were probably, um, you know, uh, just a working board, um, but they had a, 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 a one staff. So you're usually going to see more staff with the managing board because they're not having to do this heavy lifting. Provides oversight, but no work. Um, you're going to see significant board movement changes. So usually with managing boards, because you have staff, that staff is going to be there. But the board may change out um, significantly over time um, where you have board terms. Some of them are mandated board terms. Some people just, you know, kind of roll in and roll out. So therefore, you have to really kind of work hard to make consistency. Um, and then you have experienced board members. Um, me, as I would like to consider myself an experienced board member, because I've served on um, several boards um, so far, that now I really won't get on another working board, you know, ever again. I've done my PTO duties, um, kind of done, you know, the civic duties and all that kind of stuff. Now, if the organization doesn't have staff and there's no, you know, significant amount of staff that's holding down the organization, I will not serve um, on the board. So that happens a lot where, you know, people have um, are professionals and they just can't get, dedicate a bunch of time um, to an organization. Uh, you're going to find them floating more to larger boards um, that have staff. So some common problems in managing board, which is really having the board versus the executive director. Um, the ED is hired by the board and has lots of control and discretion. Um, and sometimes there's a fine line between ensuring fiduciary duties are met and micromanagement. Um, and there's nowhere to say which is too much or too little. I think it all depends on the circumstances, but it's important. Um, to really think about um, what that is supposed to look like, what you would hope it would look like. Um, and as the board changes and ED changes, um, it might shift um, just depending upon, you know, who's there. Mission creep. I think this happens with any organization, but, um, you know, it's normal to evolve with times and the needs of the community. What's not normal is kind of veering off to the mission to the point that the organization is unrecognizable. I just left um, a board um, that I was a part of for about three years um, when I came on. You know, I, one of the reasons why I wanted to join was it was a mission that I really felt strongly about, I really cared about, and I thought, okay, you know, I really want to give my time and energy to this particular mission. Well, when I got to the board, um, comes to find out that 90% of the work that the organization actually did had nothing to do with the mission that they were talking about, right? They really was not connected. They were more into government services at the time. Um, that was where the majority of their money was coming from, majority of their time. Um, and they had really kind of veered severely from the mission that they kept putting out there. That's mission creep. So honestly, while they were saying they were doing one service, the truth is, is that internally they were not doing that at all. They had completely um, veered away from that. Um, it was not recognizable at this point. Um, those two things just did not connect. 
um, and complacency. Um, while micromanagement is a, a problem, so is complacency. Board members relinquish their responsibilities to staff, um, fail to ensure that they're clear about what's happening in an organization. In the board, I was just telling you about that happened, which is why the mission creep was so um, so significant. That the board had just become complacent. They had an ED that had been there for years. Um, they had just, you know, kind of relinquished everything to the ED. Whatever the ED said, they accepted. No one questioned. And so when I came on, because I was new, I'm asking all of these questions. And the people that had been there were like, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I didn't realize this. Oh, I'm, you know, didn't know that this was happening. And my question was, you know, why didn't you know? Because you should have been asking these questions a long time ago. But they had just become complacent. Um, and just accepted um, what was going on in the organization. And I think uh, that is a significant problem as well. Okay, so I kind of went through like this first um, part kind of fast. I know it was fast, but I think that that was kind of laying the groundwork for where we're really going to spend a good amount of time, which is what's leading to disputes, right? So just think about it, understanding from a board member point of view, understanding what your fiduciary duties are, your responsibilities, how is the organization set up, and what things can cause problems um, in an organization, regardless of how it's set up, and why we need to, as attorneys, kind of think about these things, right? Think about these foundational things, because the ultimate goal is to keep the organization running um, for it not to fall apart, but if it does need to fall apart, we need to understand what needs to happen um, to, to untangle these parts, right? So the biggest thing is founder syndrome. And if anybody of you have, you know, significantly worked with nonprofits, you know, founder syndrome is real. Um, and it's very, very difficult um, when someone founds an organization to remove them from that organization. Um, I have an organization that I work with and I help. Um, with the founder, I wasn't the founder. I was just the one to do the formation and whatever else. So I've been with, you know, the organization from literally the beginning. Um, that even as a founder, someone who really cares about the organization who's bringing on strong board members, you know, I have to remind the founder, hey, this is not your organization. Now that we've asked for tax exemption, it's no longer your baby. I know you care about this, this mission. I know that. And you have to be willing to step away. Um, it's not going to always be within your control to do whatever you want, however you want. That's just not going to be the case. And so a lot of times with founders, um, you are going to see a significant amount of problems um, because they can't separate themselves from the organization. Sometimes the founder believes that they are the only person that's capable of executing the vision, right? The founder controls like all aspects of the organization. You know, if you disagree with the founder, you you know, it's, it's all hell breaks loose, right? It's a problem. Um, the bar, board acquiesces to the demands of the founder or resign. So I uh, worked with this one organization and this was not a founder is issue. It was just a rogue board member. Um, and the board member came in, started doing a bunch of crazy stuff. And the other board members, instead of stepping out, all resigned. Um, which led to a whole lot of problems. And so that is not the thing that we want people to do, but that can happen when board members will just quit. So um, again, uh, kind of seeing what's happening um, in, in an organization. A board is control that is controlled by a few people and changes are prevented from being made. Um, sometimes, you know, you've got kind of a crew that's going on and it's the cruise way or the highway. And if you don't, you know, do what these certain people want, then they're going to make your life miserable. Well, if you're working for free, nobody's going to want to stay in that situation. So again, people will just quit. Um, so here's some founder red flags and they're just not, you know, founders. Sometimes, you know, it could be somebody that's just been a long standing member of the organization. Um, I own a nonprofit that kind of grates my nerves because a nonprofit can be owned. Um, my nonprofit or Lisa's nonprofit, right. Again, kind of, Connecting the organization with yourself, um, which is not what you really want to be doing. Um, people that say, this is my baby and I'm not going to get it. so-and-so do this. Um, I have a client slash friend that has a, a small organization 
really can't and won't grow it because they really won't relinquish any control over what happens and who says what to the organization. So, you know, it's just going to stay a small organization, but that's really what they say is this is my baby and this is something we're never going to do. And I'm never going to agree to this, um, regardless if you have board members that say something want. Um, a lot of times I get asked, I want um, my bylaws that prevent me um, from being removed and that just can't happen, won't happen. Um, and having to explain to founders, like, you know, there's no, there's no permanent position for you um, in an organization. You can't do that. Um, and then I need to be paid for my time, which is not bad, right? This is not really a bad thing to say. I, I, I definitely believe that if you're putting in the time, you should be, you know, properly um, paid. However, if a grant comes in and let's just say it's $50,000, you can't take 50000 of that and say that you need to be paid for your time. Um, that's just not how that needs to work. There needs to be some idea of what that compensation will look like. Um, and there needs to be a conversation um, with the board about how that looks. And a lot of times what will happen is that there's no conversation and the founder will just take money because they're probably controlling uh, the bank account as they see fit uh, for when they need to pay this bill or that pill or whatever else. And then it basically just becomes a slush fund for um, the founder. And that is not something that we want to create. So here are some examples um, of some um, nonprofit um, founder issue issues. Um, uh, and I went through and kind of like did a search just to see like, okay, what are some, some issues with, um, nonprofit founders? And so these are, have nothing to do with me. I don't know these people, um, just like stories and stuff like that, that I got, but I wanted to kind of present to you that these are things that often happen, um, with nonprofit organizations, um, especially with founders. Um, that may not necessarily lead to prison like it does with some of these people that we're going to be talking about. But it is important to know and understand that um, this is a serious issue and that people need to know that they can't go to jail. And that is what I try to impress upon my founders or, you know, board members that, you know, this is this is criminal activity at this point. So charity founders sentenced to prison for using nonprofits to steal from donors and cheat on their taxes, right? So you have this um, group, Geraldine and Clayton Hill, right? They meant it, they use lies and false premise promises to induce companies to donate valuable goods to their nonprofit organization, um, which is a family resource center. So what they were doing was they were having clothes and other donations given to them. They would take those clothes and other goods that they were getting, sell those um, goods, and then they would keep the money. Um, and so, of course, when they did that, they ended up having um, tax, that's a revenue. And then, of course, they didn't pay taxes on that, you know, stolen money either. So um, that created a whole another profit problem, but they were stealing from the organization. And it probably, um, right, just kind of looking at this from, you know, rosy glasses kind of point of view, is that they were thinking, well, you know, we don't, this is overflow. We don't need this many, you know, pieces of clothes or we don't need this or we don't need that. So it's just good. So we're either going to throw it out um, or whatnot. So we're just going to take this, we're going to sell it. Um, and you know, instead of giving those funds back to the organization, they kept it for themselves. Um, and again, you would be surprised how often something like this happens. Again, remember the example I gave you with the snack stealing um, ED, right? That they think that it's something minor um, that they can just do, but it adds up. Um, so it's again, just impressing upon people that, you know, you have to kind of dot your I's and cross your T's when it comes to nonprofits. Um, Washington uh, AG files a lawsuit against founder of Vancouver Charity for misusing more than 1.2 million to meet, uh, meant to serve BIPOC communities. So um, this nonprofit founder um, founded um, a, a place for LGBTQ um, members of our community and took some of these assets to pay herself hundreds and thousands of dollars from foundation funds, right? To buy herself vehicles, um, to buy a house, um, those kinds of things she did. 
Um, now, probably when she started this organization, that was something that she wanted to do. It was probably something that was near and dear to her heart. But as she started getting money, um, again, this is Shahara thinking, right, that she started thinking that she's entitled to this, right? I've put my heart and soul in this. I've paid so much money out of my, you know, out of my own pocket. I should be reimbursed. And so she starts taking this money and there's no agreement from the board. There's no um, process to determine a salary. There's nothing she just takes because that's what she wants to do. And therefore, um, she gets caught at some point um, and therefore she's now maybe going to go to jail. Again, this is something that happens um, because people feel entitled. Found a Kissy based nonprofit amidst the fraud, right? So here's another one where the nonprofit provided services for um, developing disabled and it's found um, for the developing disabled, right? Um, and they claim millions of dollars were spent on Medicaid funded services between 2010 and 2019. That's a long period of time, nine years. Um, and they went for for-profit ventures. So these people really kind of just straight lied and said that it was for Medicaid, Medicaid fraud, right? They said this went for services. They didn't go to the services. They went to their private ventures, um, salaries and those kinds of things. And so again, this is really a fraudulent setup altogether. Um, and this I kind of provided in here because I think it's important to understand and ask questions when people are setting up organizations um, and how they're connected to their for-profit and nonprofit. because a lot of times people want their quote-unquote nonprofit arm so that they can get donations so the nonprofit can pay for services that other people can't pay for, but the money is really just going to the for-profit organization. And I really try to caution people against that, that not making this nonprofit a funnel um, for your for-profit venture, that's not what we want to see. Um, that could be seen as fraudulent. And last but not least, um, Van Jones, which I just kind of felt was like a really interesting um and sad founder's tale um, when it comes to this. So Van Jones um, got a significant, um, significant uh, grant from Jeff Bezos. And he, he really um, believed in the mission that Van Jones Dream.org was going to do, gave a lot of money um, to this organization, $10 million grant. Um, and they, it was, the funds were just playing on mismanaged, right? Because Van Jones, one, probably didn't know how to handle $10 million worth of grant funds, uh, trying to figure out how to spend it, what to do, um, how to leverage it. Um, a lot of money like that for a small organization could be overwhelming. Um, so this did not result in a criminal charge, but really and it resulted in Van Jones being removed from um, the organization. And this is probably a founder's worst nightmare, right? That they're going to get removed from the organization. But I think when you have a strong board and a knowledgeable board, I think it makes um, perfect sense for a founder that maybe isn't um, as skillful and knowledgeable to end up getting uh, removed from the organization because they may not just be the best organizer, right? You may have somebody that's really good to speak on the speak on the needs. They, they should be the face of the organization, but running the organization may not be their strong suit. And then, so, and here Van Jones was actually removed. So what can you do, right? So when you have issues that are happening, what things can you do? One, you want to remind people about the duty of loyalty. Um, you want to remind the founder that the organization is for the public and not them. Um, and I think you have to constantly remind people because they, they want what they want. And you have to say, I understand that this is what you want, but that doesn't mean that this is the best thing for the organization. What you want and what the organization needs may not be the same thing. And you have to be clear about this, right? Um, encourage board members to voice their concerns in writing. Um, a lot of times board members t tend to just grumble amongst themselves and not do anything. Um, you know, it's important to remind board members to take actions, that their concerns should be noting in writing. Um, they should be expressed in meeting minutes um, and fully documented. So again, this is something that I think that if we remind board members, hey, if there's a problem, you need to bring it up. You need to step up. You need to speak up. Um, you know, speak to the chair or the vice chair. Initially, um, if you don't see anything, then you need to bring it up at the meeting. You need to be clear. 
um, that there's a problem. Um, and sometimes people don't want to do it because they don't want to see be seen as a complainer. But sometimes you just need to speak up. Um, the board rogue board member, right? So the rogue board member is the one who uses their authority outside of the jurisdiction of the board as a whole, right? This person um, has just kind of gone off the rails and taken over the organization in some standpoint. Um, I, I think I mentioned previously an example of an organization that I worked with. Um, it was a civic group and the board member, I don't know, they got voted on with a group of people. I'm not really sure why this board member kind of started irritating people and getting everybody off, but all the other board members quit, like everybody else quit. And it was just this one person that was left. And that per one person took over the bank account, took over um, all the social media accounts, took over um, the email list, all of that kind of stuff. And the members had to come together. Um, I had one member pay me out of their pocket, you know, hoping to get reimbursed by, from the from the organization once you know we got back control of it to be able to deal with and get rid of this rogue board member and that took a while um several thousands of dollars later um, to get rid of that person so this person uh, can definitely be a threat to the organization because what happens is everybody else quits right and so i think one of the questions that you have to ask is it rogue or is it real right um, and so sometimes you have board members like myself who are annoying um, and probably voice their opinions and are outspoken and say, you know, I don't agree with this. I don't like this. But they're not trying to take over the organization and keep people from, you know, having access to the social media and this. They're just kind of loud. Right. Um, and so that's different from being rogue um, where they you. The, maybe the group may not like them, right? Maybe curmudgeons, but that's about it, right? So you have to kind of be able to, to see that. Is the board itself dysfunctional? Are there factions? Are there subgroups? Are there to too many sidebars going on? What's actually happening around the board? Um, is the board member simply voicing their opinion strongly or are they being a jerk? Um, how much control or influence does this board member have over the, over the organization? And how long has this board member served? Sometimes um, you have to really ask these questions to really understand the situation, um, what someone presents to you versus what's actually happening um, may not necessarily be the same. And so I think really understanding the dynamics of the board um, at the time and even sometimes going back to the board before and saying what was happening with the board before to how we get how did we get here really will help you be able to resolve some of these um, disputes that happen. So five ways to deal with a rogue board member. Um, have a board member retreat. Um, have all, Remind all board members why the organization exists and why they chose to serve. Establish a record, document and writing any issues and concerns that a board member has about certain actions. That's why having detailed meeting minutes um, along with documenting voting makes a big difference. Um, lots of nonprofits keep terrible minutes um, if they keep them at all. So um, that documentation is important. Uh, remove the board member in accordance with the bylaws. Again, that's why having good bylaws that clearly spell out removal procedure is important. Um, and then uh, bring in a third party to mediate the situation. Sometimes having somebody um, that has you know, skills and leadership expertise um, can really talk through some of the issues that boards are having. It's usually a communication issue. Um, and there are some people feel strongly about things one way or another. Um, I think that's important to have. Um, is, so having a third party uh, makes a big difference. And if concerns are being ignored, maybe going to state authorities and filing a complaint may be the next big answer. Again, it depends on what it is. Um, you know, something is more of, I don't like this person as board chair, obviously isn't going to warn a, a, a uh, a complaint, but you know, mismanagement, funds mismanagement, harassment, those kinds of things might. So I think you have to look at the situation, um, of course, with anything and really kind of determine what it is that you need to do, but creating a step to try to resolve it um, first um, and then creating precedence for each step um, will make a big difference with trying to get it resolved. Um, let me just ask how much time I see. I got like five minutes left. So um, should I stop now to ask questions or do y'all want me to go through this last piece, which is really about documents?
So we can take a break right now to ask if there are any um, questions or we'll send another reminder for um, individuals to put questions in the chat or in the Q&A as this time we do not have any. Um, so okay. I can allow for uh, 15 to 30 seconds or so if we can start to see some come in here. Um, if not, please proceed and then um, I'm happy to check back in in about two minutes if we have any more. Okay, sounds great. Um, so here's some documents that make a difference. Um, so uh, as bylaws, what should they cover at a minimum? You should have, you know, the board member management. Um, I usually don't use position, quote unquote, seats for board members. Like there should no, be no dedicated attorney and dedicated CPA seat or anything like that. I don't really agree with that. Um, one, because I don't like professionals having being forced to use their profession um, for free in a in a nonprofit organization, but two, uh, you know, if you just don't have, you know, any attorney isn't going to just fit in there, any CPA isn't just going to fit in there. Um, so we just don't want to have those kinds of things. But you may have your officer, board officer positions, again, which are going to be general, your chair, vice chair, um, maybe president, or vice president, depending on what you're naming them, treasurer, secretary. Usually at minimum, you have to have a president and a secretary of the board. So um, that's the way you want to at least um, have in your bylaws. Officers, um, that goes to just what I was just telling you before. If it's a membership organization, a lot of times I'll see people that I'll draft and say that they have members, but they really don't have members. A membership organization is something where not necessarily you have to pay um, to be a member, but uh, let's just say an HOA, um, you might have a PTO that has members, um, a church that has members. Um, so those are real membership organizations. Membership is not, you know, we want people to be donated. We want to people to have donations and that's their quote unquote membership, like a zoo membership, right? So you could be a member of the zoo. That's not what we're talking about here um, in the members because as a zoo member, I have no rights to vote or anything with the organization. So that's a different kind of thing where we're just talking about it as a fundraising, as opposed to these people have rights um, to who controls the organization. Um, committees, if there will be committees, um, I would only specially name the standing committees. Those are that are required to exist. But what I would do is that say that the board has permission to create um, committees, you know, ad hoc as they choose. Um, and then if there are specific committees that have to be there, like a nominating committee or something like that, then I will name those in the bylaws. Um, transactions, the majority of the bylaws will probably consist of various acts transaction of the organization, any audits that are required, um, anything that has to do with, um, you know, voting requirements or procedures. Um, uh, what is that? Um, just your fiscal year, those kinds of things. What, what does that look like? Um, so you want to cover some of that. And then a conflict of interest. So the IRS does require that a tax exempt organization have a conflict of interest policy. Typically in the bylaws, I just take the IRS um, version of their conflict of interest policy and put it into the bylaws. So I just add it into the bylaws. Um, and I think that's sufficient for the bylaws themselves. And then you may want to have separate conflict of interest um, that build upon that for certain things. Um, so there may be certain um, programs and policies that you have that you may need additional conflict of interest um, policies in place. But I usually use the IRS version and just add it to the bylaws. So some policies that you may want to have, privacy policies, whistleblower protection policies, document re and review rec uh, document and records retention policy. These are just some policies that, you know, you want to be clear about how you're handling um, privacy, which I think is very important, who has access. Um, sometimes board members will want to get information on someone um, that they're having uh, some client, maybe they want some client information. Uh, they may ask about some contracts and want information on that. And there should be a policies about who has access to what information. Um, and the board is not necessarily entitled to all of that documentation, right? So I think it being clear about what the board can and can't see, I think it's very important. Um, and of course, you know, whistleblower, if there's some issue that's happening in legal activities, what's the process, right? If it's the ED that's a problem, can it, is there one person on the board that needs to be um, brought in or reported to if there's no HR and what kinds of things, how do we deal with that? Um, and then your records retention policy, of course, you know, you, 
a longstanding organizations may have documents going back for 20 years. Sometimes you just need to get rid of that crap um, and having a way to um, organize that, get rid of stuff, um, you know, and not have it, you know, kind of uh, lagging on for 20 years, stuff that needs to just go away. Um, financial policies, executive compensation policy, fundraising policies, and these are kind of some extras. I say I think that of the of these, I would say that financial policy is really um, probably top notch. Some of that may be in um, the bylaws, but really that bylaws really have to do with board management. Um, it doesn't really have to do with organizational management. So as you build out staff and have more people. Financial policies might be necessary with about gift giving, um, credit card usage. I had a client um, that, for whatever reason, they decided to give everybody debit cards um, to the bank account. And surprise, surprise, people were misusing it. So we had to recall the, you know, the debit cards and say, okay, now we got to decide like which two or three people have access to credit cards. Who can, you know, use these credit cards? What's the reimbursement policy? All of those kinds of things. And so um, I think as an organization grows um, and gets more sophisticated, more of these policies are going to need it. I am not one to over paper. Um, if it's a small organization and nine times out of 10, they're not even going to pay attention to these policies. I wouldn't have them. But as an organization grows, gets more money, has more grants, um, that's something that you need to do. Um, and then, of course, you just want to make sure that you clarify roles and responsibilities, um, encourage job evaluation. And this is not just of the ED, but of the board themselves to really look, are you really serving this organization? Are you bringing your best you know, service self to this organization? Are, and, and ask them to evaluate themselves um, to see whether or not they're doing what they need to be doing as a board member. Uh, implement a grievance procedure, maybe. Um, sometimes, like I said, board members tend to grumble amongst themselves, um, but there's no real way for them to say that they're upset about something. Um, and it would be nice to be able to have a procedure about that. Um, establish a code of conduct for directors um, would be nice. Um, again, these are things that a lot of organizations don't have, but would be good to have, especially when you're talking about disputes and what's uh, what's allowable and what's not. Deal with conflicts when it arises um, and lead to gender and culture differences when handling conversations. Um, you know, people um, tend to have different ways of communicating. I'm a very, very direct um, person. I tend to say what I think and, you know, think what I say. Um, so some people can't handle that. Some people, you know, are very kind of, what do you use the word? You know, they, they're very gentle about how to handle, tell a story, walk around the bend before they get to their point um, because they don't really like direct um, confrontation. And in just in that way of their means of communication could cause problems. And it's not that somebody's wrong and what they're saying is just how it's being delivered. And so learning how to communicate because when you have an a board, um, you know, you're probably having you know, at least seven to 15 people with different personalities, different backgrounds, different cultures having to come together um, and agree. Uh, it's very difficult. And as attorneys, it's hard to even get two people to agree, right? When you're talking about seven to 15 people, that's another different story. So we have to make sure that communication um, is done well so that we can ensure that everybody's on one page. So that's it. I know that that was like a fast run through, but we started late. And so I'm sorry. And we're over um, a little bit. Um, but that's me. I'm Shahara Wright. This is my contact information. Uh, my email is not on here, but it's Shahara, my first name, at the right lawyer .com. Um, And you can connect with me on Facebook, LinkedIn. Um, I also have a Facebook group called um, Lawyers Who Love Nonprofits. So if you want to join there, and that's really all kinds of lawyers who some that work with nonprofits like I do, some that are serve on boards, some that are EDs, some just, you know, interested in passing by. Um, so if you just want to learn and hear more about nonprofits, I'm a terrible, uh, you know, community leader in there. I don't post very often, but it's a good group of people, um, good conversations when they do happen. So that is all for me. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then see if you guys have any questions. Thank you so much, Ms. Wright. Um, we do not have any typed questions. 
Um, but please, if anyone would like to uh, add additional uh, commentary here or have questions, please feel free to leave it in the chat. We'll stay here um, for the next five minutes or so if we have additional questions. Um, but otherwise, Ms. Wright, thank you so much for sharing your time and your insights with us. We will have the re recording available on our YouTube channel. Please see in the chat the self-report CLE uh, number. Um, we are going to copy uh, and paste it here again for those who may have joined late. Um, please uh, ensure that you stay uh, connected with us at www.hyla.org and to follow us at, at Houston Young Lawyers on Instagram uh, and our other social media platforms. Again, uh, thank you, Ms. Wright, um, and we wish everyone a great day. Thank you, and you have a great day, too. We will stop the recording now, but we'll stay on if anyone has additional questions until about 1.10.